I have done my time as a programmer uh, way back in the dark ages. I wrote uh, hex code with, on a data acquisition system without a compiler. So you now know how old I am. Linda may have remembered those days. Rebecca. <laughs> um, I work in building ship positioning systems. Uh, I got a master's degree in computer science. Took uh, the first computer systems out on submersible oil rigs. Worked on control systems for electrical power plants in Switzerland. Um, the product manager for work management systems at nuclear power plants. I built the electronic stock exchange for the Swiss banks. I had failed twice before I got there. The first time uh, the Swiss tried to build it and it went too slow. And the second time, Arthur Anderson, remember those guys? Yeah, yeah. They gave us 9,000 pages of design documentation and we took a look at it and said it won't work. So uh, when I did that project, I was technically dead, so all I could do was really lead. And during that time, um, agile practices emerged. 120 people. We did uh, pair programming, one-week sprints, three-month release cycles, continuous integration, test-driven development. And that was 25 years ago. So I've uh, been kind of working in the agile space for a long time. And I got in, I started, uh, I worked as an executive in a bank running a technology department. And then I started my own consulting company in 1996. Jeez, that's 18 years, my goodness, time flies. So I have um, met a lot of very interesting people, had some great conversations, been involved in the Agile community since I helped organize the first one day Agile conference in Salt Lake and then the first four day one. And I've been involved in the Agile world ever since. So uh, I write a lot and I speak a lot. So just Google me and you'll find a few things to, to stretch your brains a little bit. So let's see about this. So I'm going to talk about who are non collaborators, what makes them tick, your intentions and risks, and finally, I'm going to give you some tools on how you can deal with these. So first off, we want all the non-collaborators to sit over here, <laughs> and all the collaborators over here, okay? Nobody's moving, okay, I got it. <laughs> so, the one interesting thing to me is a non-collaborator can be many things. It can be a process. My perfect example of a non-collaborator process in the Agile world is independent performance reviews with stack ranking. How bad is that one? Do you think that supports collaboration, teamwork, anybody? No, it's a killer. You don't want your buddy next to you to do better than you are. Because you, in all of you, you won't have a job. You don't want to be the one on the bottom of the list. So it's a very bad, so that's one process. I'm sure you can think of a lot of them. The other ones, it can be a person or a team in any one of these areas around here. Your team, other teams, your peers, your leaders, other leaders. So there's a lot of different areas where people can be non-collaborators. Now, I want you to all think of a non-collaborator, right, that you know of, that you're struggling with. So I bet that didn't take long, <laughs> right? <laughs> How many of you got one in mind? And why are you in this class? <laughs> so, what type are they? How many of you have a leader that's a non-collaborator? How many of you have a team member that's non-collaborator? How about another team that's non-collaborator? Oh boy, oh, how can that be? The big winner, and anybody have a process that's non-collaborative? Oh boy, you raised your hand several times. <laughs> I like that. You must have a lot. <laughs> so let's take a look about why people don't collaborate. My opinion, the first one is they lack of collaboration skills. They don't know how to do collaboration. Right? That's very difficult for them, and they need to learn. You know, in the world we live in, people want to be uh, able to say, I know what I'm doing. They want to be able to make it happen. And they may have lack of trust with the people they have to collaborate with. So they 
don't quite trust them. Maybe there's some reasons that there's this conflict between them. Another reason is fear. They may fear. This is really a big one in collaboration. A lot of people fear losing control, especially managers. Then they fear someone taking their credit from them. This is the result of staff ranking independent performance reviews. And this one is a really big one. They're afraid of failure. In our economic times, this is very difficult. Because if you fail and your company doesn't allow you to fail gracefully, then oftentimes you worry about whether you're going to have a job in the future or not. The third one, which I find, unfortunately, the most common is, it's all about me. Anybody have one of these guys in their list? Oh, <laughs> it's all about me. Looks like this. They're a little self-centered. Don't you love the picture? <laughs> That's what I think about them. They're a little self-centered. They're uh, often passive aggressive. I was working with uh, uh, the Utah Transit Authority executives once, and I saw the vice president of technology walking down the hall one day, and I said, you know, do you have any passive aggressive people on your team? And he said, every one of them. <laughs> I said, whoa, OK. <laughs> so uh, they want power and control. I love this one. And then they probably have some personal agendas, most likely. But above all, they must win. <coughs> they have to win. They don't care what it is, but they have to win. So what does this look like? It looks like they withhold information. Oh, I'm sure you don't have this in your company anymore. <laughs> they're working on a team, or they're working with some people. They withhold information. The team struggle starts to fail. They swoop in, give them the information, and then everything works out, correct? Yep. <laughs> They're the heroes, correct? And what does the organization do? They reward them. We are our own worst enemies. We reward these people, so what are they going to do next time? Do it again. I worked with a uh, company of architects. I mean, even architects can do agile. So I worked with these architects, one of the executives. We, I asked the teams, how do they got the right people on their team? Because they would start these projects without the right people. I said, when do you get them? They said, when we go into crisis, then they give us the right people. I said, so what do you do? And they said, well, we put our, we put our projects in crisis. <laughs> I said, oh, I see. So when the executive heard about this, <laughs> he brought one of those red gas cans that you use to bring gas to your car and put it in his office right by the door and said, don't build a fire to put it out. We don't want that. So it's fascinating. The other thing is <laughs> they don't just act superior to, each other, to others. They know they're superior to others. And they sabotage others in an effort to, so they look better. It's really amazing to watch when that happens. And they always want to be in the spotlight. So they're all, they will collaborate on projects where it's going to be, they will be in the spotlight. And they will be seen and recognized by the rest of the organization. It's fascinating. So take a minute now and think about your non-collaborator, the ones you all have in your mind by now. It's glued there. <laughs> and think, is it lack of collaboration skills? Is it fear? Or is it all about me? Now, it can be more than one of them, and it can be all of them. It's a very interesting combination. So how many of you have the, just the lack of collaboration skills for your non <laughs> we'll get to all of them after the end. <laughs> How about fear? They have fear of collaborating. Yeah. Okay. And how about it's all about me? Oh, really? That's amazing. How about all of them? 
Pretty interesting, don't you think? Okay. So, first thing you have to do with this non-collaborator is try and understand the system when they're working or what makes them tick. It's a very interesting exercise here. So, you, you might not get actual data, you might, but you're going to have to trust some of your intuition on this. Read between the lines and try and figure out the answer to these questions. Where's their focus? What motivates them? Are their motivators? Is it being in the spotlight? Is it to work for the right, you know, to be motivated this, to move up in the organization? Do they want to be recognized by the vice president, the CEO? What do they want? What motivates them to do what they're doing? How do they measure or define their success? Success winning? Is there success being promoted? Is there success making a lot of money? It's usually not the team success. I hate to say it, but it might not be. Then you have to understand what their fears are and above all know their hot buttons. Because when you start collaborating with them, you don't want to step on one of the hot buttons. <coughs> Do you all know what those are, hot buttons? Some people ask me, what does that mean? It means something that you talk about and that person all of a sudden goes ballistic. You go, what, what happened there? I don't understand that. So you have to be careful and try and understand what they are and stay away from them. And the last one you have to think about is if they have any hidden agendas. Now obviously you're not gonna know what that is because it's hidden. <laughs> but I can guarantee you, if you're working with somebody that has a, an agenda, you know they have one. <laughs> Somehow you get the clue that they got one. You might not know what it is, but you have an idea that there is one. So what you, you have to now figure out, after you've figured them out, why you want to collaborate with your non-collaborator. What's your agenda here, personally? Do you need information for them to succeed at what you're doing? Do you need action from them to get your jobs done? Do you need them to stand back and leave you alone, and not micromanage you or get in your way? So take a minute and think about what your agenda is for you and why you're doing this. If you want to change them, and that's your personal agenda, I got news for you, it's not going to happen. You are not going to change them, so don't even think about it. I'll give you some tools on dealing with them, but you're not going to change them. You can only change processes, not people. You're never going to get them to do it differently. The second thing you have to take into account before you start this is what your risks are. Because dealing with a non-collaborator, depending on their position and power in the organization, may go terribly bad in the process. Misunderstandings, being hurt feelings, not being, you know, not understanding what you're trying to say. It goes on and on and on. So you have to look at all of these things to see what you are willing to risk. Can you handle being fired? Can you handle finding another job within three months? So when I worked on the stock exchange, I got on the project and it was totally fear-based. So I guess you can even you can call that process fear, a process that's broken for sure, non-collaborating, whatever it was. But the idea was that anybody who brought bad news to the president, head of the project, would end up in this office we call the departure lounge. <laughs> because after three months, they were out of the company. It was the departure lounge. That's where you waited to leave. It was absolutely phenomenal. So we had to get over that or it wasn't going to work out. So you have to be able to willing to deal with any of these. You can handle your career being derailed because you may be put outside the inside circle. And you have to decide whether you can live with it or not, what you can live with. You have to figure it out personally. It's nothing I can do. There are a lot of risks. 
you may end up. Can you survive without your mentors? And can you let someone else take credit for your accomplishments? There's a lot of things you have to think about when you engage here. But the one thing I can say is this. <coughs> Recall successful risks you have taken in the past. How many of you are married? <laughs> that might be a risk that you took. I don't know. I'm not doing it. I'm not married, so I just sort of, I don't know what I was doing, raising my hand. That may be a risk that you've taken in your past. But I don't know leaders or people in an organization that doesn't get to a leadership position without taking risks. So remember the ones that you have taken and that were successful when you start to analyze it. Remember you have some experience in successful risk taking and what it is. Okay? All righty. Now, let's deal with our non collaborators here comes the tools. First one, speak their language. So, <laughs> developers come into the office and they go like this. <laughs> and the manager says, I don't know, what are they trying to tell me? <laughs> Obviously, they got something to say. <laughs> you can tell. The idea is that leaders come to me and say, well, I can't understand their language now. They don't know how to communicate. And I always say to them, did you hand, hire them for their communication skills? And they go, oh. I said, your job is to learn to talk to them and to learn to listen in their language. Not the other way around. Stop wasting their time. So I used to go into uh, managers' offices and say, hey, I need another person for this team. We're down there working overtime, working on weekends. It's just killing the team. We've got to have one more person. And here's what the manager's thinking. I thought that's the way all software projects work. Right? <laughs> and then the other thing is, you know, that's the way they love to work. I don't, they don't need help. So I discovered I wasn't speaking the language of the leader, the manager. What is the language of managers? Anybody? Money. ROI. Money. ROI, money, and time. All of it. It is money. So then I thought to myself, okay. So I'd sit down, I'd figure out what it costs to bring one person on board. I'd figure out the break even point and what we could accomplish with having another one on board. And then I'd go in and talk to them in their language. So it really made a difference. They could understand that what hiring one more person would do to help the organization and save money in the long run. So that's what, that was the way I learned to speak so I could be heard. The other one is practice a forward going approach. You go forward to them, don't wait for them to come to you because it probably won't happen. You need to reach out to them, work with them. When you have problems, bring solutions, not just problems. Because if you bring pro just problems, what I call that is whining. Nobody likes that, even if they're a non-collaborator. You'll be shredded. Always make sure you bring solutions. Watch your timing. This is really, really big. So I had a guy on a project working with the team and we were doing some agile techniques. And he blew up the sprint totally for the whole team. It was not a pleasant experience. Of course, I let him come to the scrum meeting and talk to the team about it. And they expressed their feelings. And then I talked to him afterwards. Two weeks later, he came back and asked me for a raise. This is bad timing. <laughs> Don't do that. Be careful when you talk to them. Especially if your non-collaborator is having a bad day. And you can tell they're, not, they're pretty open about it. They don't hide that stuff. They're having a bad day, stay out of their way. When things are going well for them, deal with them then. Just stay out of their way. Watch how you your timing with them. Tips, 
for dealing with general lists. This is the biggest tip you are ever going to get about dealing with a non-collaborator. And I find most people fail at this and then wonder why they can't get their non-collaborator to the table. How many people pick up the phone and call their non-collaborator alone with just them on the phone? It's not going to make it happen. You're not going to get there. Because they'll hang up and then they'll go say something else. I don't like it, but it's the reality. Let's be real. Always have three people in the room or in your collaboration or on the phone. This is based on game theory that Nash developed and won the Nobel Prize for, the Beautiful Mind guy. And so it means you put three people in the room. Now, that doesn't mean that you get somebody who thinks your way to gang up on this one person. Now, that's really not what I'm talking about here. A neutral person will work. Bring somebody along just to listen because you can find out game theory is a Two people are working, talking to each other and one withholds information. It's very difficult to discover it. But if three people are working together and one withholds information, it's easier for them to discover it. That's the key here. That's the principle of game theory. Make sense? Very, very powerful. So find some common ground no matter what it is. Now for me, I had this non-collaborator in Colorado that I was trying to work with. Boy, she was really a piece of work. It was very difficult. Really hard for me. And I heard all over the organization that she didn't like what I was doing, my teaching, my coaching. She didn't like anything. It was like, well, we don't have to do this. So I had to go out there and work with them on a project to do some planning. And I went, oh, I wonder if she's going to be in the room. Sure enough, I showed up. There she was. Okay, let me see what I can do. So I tried to find some common ground. I worked and worked and worked at it. And finally, during the break, I found out that she had some dogs. And I have a dog that I dearly love. So we talked dogs. And all of a sudden, she lightened up a little bit. I don't know. I mean, I thought to myself, it's not related to work, but it worked. Find any common ground you can find. Anything no matter what it is, no matter how small. It makes a connection between you two. And then you're not seen as the total enemy. You have to share information and be transparent. <coughs> be very careful. Because if you don't trust them, or you're afraid they'll misuse this information against you, then don't share it. That doesn't mean I would lie. Somebody asks me for a piece of information, I'll tell them. Or I'll say, I don't understand how that fits with the project or the topic at hand. But I'll try, I'll be as honest as I can with them. Because if you're not honest with them, they will know it. They will chew you up and they will spit you out. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding. <laughs> the next one is to give them data before they need it. Don't ask them to wait. Don't wait for them to ask for it. Give it to them immediately. Give them all you have. This helps them understand that you're in their corner trying to help them do whatever they're doing and succeed at what they want to succeed at. And this should relate to back to the beginning where you did the assessment on what motivates them, what do they focus on, that helps you figure out how to present that data and what data they're really going to need. Make sense? Is this making any sense? Oh, it's so scary. Find an influencer to influence your non-collaborator. This is the next big one besides having three people in the room. So I had this executive who had this council, this task group, task force group that they were working for this executive. And the head of the task force was very command and control. And the non-collaborator she didn't listen to what anybody said on the team. Nothing. So she'd report up to the vice president, this executive, what she wanted to tell. What a surprise. <laughs> Shocking, isn't it, that that would happen? 
So the vice president would get on the phone with this person, this chair, and talk with them. And she would say to the, say to the vice president, this, this, and this, and this, these are the things we're going to do. Then she'd go back and talk to the people on the committee. And they'd say, that's not what we said. So she could never get this person to actually agree. And she wouldn't let anybody else on the phone call. So first she's done the three-person rule wrong. She didn't do that. The next one is, I said to her, said to this, but this went on for six months and weren't making any progress. So I said, is there anyone in the organization that this chair listens to and respects? I said, so go find that person and see if they'll help you talk to this person and will help influence this person. And that's what she did. It broke the ice and pretty soon the committee was working just fine. So this is a very powerful tool. Next, do you all believe this sentence? High trust equals low command and control. Anybody disagree with me on this one? Can you have command and control and trust people? I don't know, maybe. But I don't think that people feel trusted. Anyone? You guys are not going to argue with me. <laughs> Eugene scared you to death. <laughs> All right, let's look at this trust and ownership model. For some of you that attended the workshop yesterday, there'll be some pieces here, but I'll move on beyond it. I just want to explain the model here. We have high trust and low control, and these are leaders or processes over here, or your non-collaborator, or whatever you want it to be. And down here we have ownership, team and individual ownership. So, if I have high trust and no ownership, what happens? What do I get? Pardon? Nothing. Nothing. You get, I hate to bring this word up, but you get failure, you know. Nothing happens. This is the worst fear for leaders, right? They don't want to fail. They won't even let their teams fail. They're scared to death of this situation. So what do they do? They start controlling, so they drop down here, and we get this. Command and control, often referred to as micromanagement. 80% of the companies in America are still operating down here. It's a number I don't like, but it doesn't seem to get too much better, but there's only one of me and a few of these other people that talk about leadership. In the Agile community, we're still trying our best so, if you're down here and the team wants to have ownership, what do you get? Over here. What are you gonna, what's going to happen? You have a, rev a revolution? You get a revolution. Boy, that's it. <laughs> you take over the leader? You could. A coup? A coup. A coup. <laughs> you're a lucky. What do you get when you move over here? Infighting. Pardon? Infighting. Infighting. Uh, yeah, you get a lot of conflict. Okay. Now, where we want to be is up here, correct? That's where we want to be. The failure state, as we mentioned, is not sustainable. You can't stay up here. You're going to fall down to here, or you're going to go over, or fall down to here. You might go over here, but that's really hard. Usually what happens is it goes down here. The conflict state is also not sustainable. People won't fight forever, they'll give up and come back over here. So the real trick is to go from here to here. But this model helps us figure out our non-collaborators. Where are they sitting on this model? I don't think many of them are up here. Is that correct? Anybody have their non-collaborator up here? Nobody's raising their hand. So there's somewhere around here, here, and here. How many of you have your non-collaborator up here in failure? How about down here in command and control? Oh yeah, there it is. Or down here in conflict. Yeah, you can have them anywhere in here. That's true. So let's see if we take each one of these pieces and look at where we are. Abdication and failure, micromanagement, conflict and low productivity, innovation and delivery. Let's take conflict first. Anybody know about appreciative inquiry? Anybody in here? 
Now, I forgot to mention I was a mathematician when I started in school, and then I did three years of graduate studies in theoretical physics. So what am I doing talking about the soft stuff? <laughs> the squishy stuff. I can't imagine how that happened. But I try my best to live with it. Appreciative inquiry came along when I came into the Agile community, and people like Linda and Rebecca and Diane Larson said to me, you should really take a look at appreciative inquiry. I said, well, it has those soft words like passion and energy, you know, can't be of any use. They said, really, you should take a look at it. So finally, I took a look at it, and it's useful. <laughs> it's really useful. So you can take four day courses on it, but I'm going to give you the basics in about two minutes. So stand by. <laughs> appreciative inquiry. Our old way of solving problems is this way. You identify the problem, you analyze the causes, and you plan the actions. You assume, the assumption here, is the organization is the problem to be solved. That's looking backwards. Appreciative inquiry looks forward. It's like this, you value what is, you envision what can be, you discuss the next steps. So the organization and the people know the possibility. So I was helping a friend of mine who wanted to be, who was a doctor, opening her own clinic. And she hired a contractor and she said, Pollyanna, will you help us manage the contract, you know, the building, the build out of this, our office? I said, sure, I'll help you do that. So the contractor came to me with his budget and he started working on it. Now, any of you ever know a contractor that actually sticks to the budget? If you do have one of those, let me know. <laughs> I'd like to know that person, but I've never seen it happen. It always goes up. It never goes down. So anyway, I walk past my friend's office, and she's in there with uh, the contractor talking, uh, you know, and I'm going. And my friend has her sweater up over her nose and sitting all bundled up like this. And I went, oh, I bet this conversation's not going well. <laughs> the body language was pretty, uh, pretty blunt. So uh, I stopped by and I said, hey, you guys want a glass of wine? And they said, no, sit down here. This problem is yours too. I said, what's the problem? <laughs> and they said, well, uh, we've run over budget. And the doctor said, I don't have any more money. And well, there were pieces I ran over budget. And I said, yeah. He said, this is your fault. You wouldn't let me add more to the budget. I said, really? He said, I don't remember that, but that's OK. I'll assume responsibility. He said, what? I said, OK, I did it. I wouldn't let you have that. He said, well, you made me do it. I said, yeah. I said, I assume responsibility for that. That's OK. If you want me to assume financial responsibility, I will. He said, uh, really? I said, the right people in the room to solve this problem are here. You're either going to have to find more money, the doctor, or the doctor is going to have to make decisions on what not to finish at this point. I said, let's go forward and solve this problem. And he said to me, you know, I really don't like your psychological games. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think that's psychological. That's just basics. <laughs> so they worked it out. So we're down here. I call this falling forward. That's how we remember it. Go forward. Oh, the perfect example. I love this story. It's my, it's my roommate and my dog. <laughs> I lived uh, in Connecticut for a while as a roommate. And we had this house that was uh, on two acres of land, right? So my dog, Missy, gets ready to, she wants to go out at 10 o'clock at night. And my roommate says, don't let her out. And I said, uh, OK. And she, my roommate goes to bed. And then I, I go, oh, my poor dog. <laughs> so what do I do? I let her out. <laughs> what was I thinking? Because she doesn't want to come back in. It's dark out there, and she's rolling around over the whole yard having a really grand old time. She will not come in for me. Now, I know she'll do it for my roommate. So I holler up. My roommate comes down. And she comes out there. And she looks at me, and she says, I told you not to let the dog out. And I look at her, and my exact words were, this is not helping me get the dog in the house. 
Needless to say, she didn't like appreciative inquiry at that point. <laughs> she tried again, and I said, it's really not helping me get the dog in here. And she said, OK. So it works everywhere, folks. Trust me. It's a very powerful tool, and I'd use it. So it looks like this. Instead of going backwards and ending up possibly, most likely, in the blame game, you got to go forward. See, there's that soft word, passion. Figure out where the energy is and start following that and going forward. Make sense? Get the job done. Don't look back. I always believe that we learn more from how we recover from our mistakes than how we got there. There is no point in doing a post-mortem, believe me. How many of you have gone back and read a lessons learned document from a year ago? Don't all raise your hands here. Why we are doing that is a puzzle to me. It is a waste. The, insta, the learning from the mistake is institutionalized. And it is there. And all you have to do is say, well, we want to try this. And somebody will say, wait a minute. Somebody did that. Let me go check. But you don't have to grill somebody about what went wrong. That's baloney. Sorry. That's the way I feel. Ah, oh, here's the big one. Micromanagement. Another one. Understand why they are micromanaging. Are they insecure? They don't know what they're doing. They have to have control for some reason. Whatever it is, you've got to figure it out. You build this cube together with your non-collaborator and talk about, let's work inside here together. These are our constraints for working on a project together. If it's your boss, it's very effective to do this with them and say, hey, stay out of my cube. And you have to be a little more polite than that. Managers don't like blunt talk. You have to check in with regularly. This was a phenomenon of mine. I don't usually uh, talk much about the difference between men and women in the businesses anymore because I am very hopeful that there's a lot of equality going on here. and There's a lot of women in the room here. But you know, I'm old. Back in the old days when women first started going in the workplace, women would come into work and they'd go, they'd say, okay, if I do a really good job, I'll be recognized for my work. So, but what was really going on with the men there before, or other people there before, is they go down to their boss at the end of the day, or the end of the week, and tell them everything they did all week. And so, and what, if that's the case, and that's the model, what are they thinking about this woman who never comes and tells them what they've been doing? What are they thinking? She's not doing anything. She's not doing anything. So you need to check in regularly, whether you're a guy or a girl. You have to see what your, your micromanager, you have to reassure them what you're doing, where you're going, whatever's happening. So I had the, at the stock exchange, the president of the company, uh, he would like to have been a micromanager, that's for sure. But every Sunday afternoon, he'd be doing his paperwork in the office. And where do you think I was every Sunday afternoon? Sunday walking your dog. Uh-huh. I was in the office <laughs> talking to this person. And I would tell him everything we had done, accomplished the week before. And then I would tell him everything we were going to accomplish the next week. And he left me alone. And he left my team alone. So I would just check in with them all the time and let them know what was happening. So you have to also think that if you don't trust your micromanager, whether you can build it or not, because maybe if you can't, then you have to move on. So then let's talk about this one, abdication and failure. The passive non-collaborator, I love this one. Actually, the, the passive aggressive one is even more interesting. They're fearful, they lack understanding, maybe cultural differences, they may have differing goals than the rest of the team. The problem is you don't know much, because they're passive, they're very quiet. They're sitting there listening. So you have to figure out what they're passionate about. <laughs> what makes them passion because P 
people do what we're passionate about? How many of you can't wait to get out of this conference tonight and go and do all those things on the bottom of your to-do list that keep dropping down there? How many? Yeah, you can't wait, can you? I do believe they're still going to be there on Monday morning. I don't know why, but I could guarantee it. They may be there next time I come to talk. <laughs> Who knows? We only do what we're passionate about. So you need to find out what they're passionate about. And you have to talk to them about what's holding them back from pursuing that passion and try and enable them and help them to pursue it. So you have to advocate for them and help them pursue their passion. So that's easier and not so hard. You just have to figure out what their passion is about. Uh, I talked about this yesterday about some questions I use. One of them is, what was a major turning point in your life? What's a book you read that made a big impact on your life? Um, how do you define compassion? So I ask people these kind of questions because then I get to know who they are and what they're about. So it's very interesting. Here it is, the one we've been waiting for. Passive aggressive non-collaborator. Unfortunately, they do the most damage. You know what a passive aggressive person is? They sit in the room and say, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they go outside the room and say, well, that was a piece of crap. We're not doing that. Just after they agreed to it. Passive aggressive, you know. Or you'll be sitting in a meeting very quietly. They'll be sitting there very quietly and all of a sudden there's a zinc sent right across the room aimed right at you, and often it's personal. You go, ooh, ooh what happened? What was that? I just got hit. So they're competitive. They don't have much respect. They're all interested in self-preservation. And they definitely have a personal agenda. That's a fact. So whatever happens, do not engage with them in a power struggle because just because you engaged, they have won. So just stay out of it. The other one is, how do you deal with these people? You wrap them in process. It's so great. So people say, well, what if I don't have a process for them? I said, how do you think all those useless processes in your organization got formed? <laughs> It's to manage one micromanager, and they just forgot to get rid of it. So go back and either use one of those or make another one. Whatever you do, don't let them dodge accountability by saying you don't have the authority, because you do have the authority. And whatever you do, make them step into the responsibilities that they must do, and it's the only step they can take that process again. and it's good. The real big barrier here is make them commit into public because if you get them into private they'll say I didn't say that and take the fun out of being dysfunctional. Now this means that if people in your organization are being dysfunctional, disruptive, or passive aggressive continuously they're getting some kind of reward. Even if it's negative, it's a reward. A lot of times, these people will occupy your office a lot and go on and on. And you kind of sit there and go, what's the point of this? And all they've done is take up some of your airtime. So they can say, oh, I was in the office with the boss. That's a reward. You gave them airtime. You have to be very careful. So I had this uh, board I was working on. And I did my collaborative leadership thing we were trying to do. The board, uh, they were doing their strategic planning for the year. And all the staff was there. And during the break, the president of the board came up to me. And he said this question that was rhetorical, which meant he just wanted to fight. I'm not going to waste my time. You know, I said my opinion. I don't care if you, you know, I'm not going to argue about it. You just want to argue. He's in passive aggressive. So I stood there like this. He asked me the question, and I did not move, and I did not say a word. I just looked at him. 
no reward whatsoever. He tried it again at the next break, and she did the same thing. And then he stopped. And in the afternoon, when we started doing the sticky notes about what they wanted to accomplish in the coming year, he said, this is ridiculous, I'm not doing this. And I stood behind a pole, and I quietly said, so only he could hear me, I said, come on, Peter, you know, the team needs your help, they need your, your interaction. He didn't even get to see me say it, which is very quiet, and he participated. A month or two later, they had one of their staff members that was very disruptive every single day in the office, and they decided to let her go. And the president of the board went down with the executive director and fired him, and he said to her, you know, I've discovered that I'm pretty disruptive on my board, and I'm trying not to do that anymore. But my board only meets once a month, and you're disruptive in the office every day. So that's why we're letting you go. <laughs> but he did get the drift. We're not rewarding people for bad behavior. You have to move on. So don't reward people and watch when you do it. You'll be surprised. So find something you agree on, no matter how small it is. Anything you can agree on. You know, maybe it's politics. Who knows? And always ask them how they want to solve the rest of the problem you agree on something and say how do you want to deal with the rest and see if they'll step up. Remember, don't let them answer this without somebody else in the room. You only deal with these kind of people with three people. Whatever you do, don't let these people be leaders. <laughs> now half of you are going saying it's too late. <laughs> I know, that's a real bummer. It's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. I'm sorry to tell you, it's not fun. So you, I don't know, try and deal with them, but it's not fun. Non-collaborating processes, the best thing you could do is form some process improvement groups using value stream maps, trying to figure out what's wrong. The other day, you know, Almost everybody in the Agile community that does it for very long hates independent performance reviews, right, guys? They're so anti-Agile. And we just, it's very difficult to get. And the teams, after they're doing Agile for a while and they're trying to live in this independent performance review environment, go ballistic. They start getting really unhappy. So one conference, we're sitting around in the break talking about <coughs> how we could fix it. And the final I looked at him and I said, you know, you're taking, you want ownership on your teams, right? Yeah. You're taking ownership away from HR. I said, if you, you have to push back on them to solve the problem. You have to sit down with them, find somebody that you can talk to, learn their language, learn the lingo, sit down with them and say, this is the damage that's happening in our organization because of independent performance reviews. Can you help us? Can you help us with something that's more that will inspire and help us do collaboration and not be a barrier? But when we talk about we want ownership, don't take ownership away from the people that are causing you pain. Push it back to them and say, this is what we need. This is why it's not working. Can you help us? And let them figure it out. They obviously have a reason for doing independent performance reviews. I have no clue what it could possibly be. And I've been trying to think about it for a really long time. And I can't find one reason, not one inch of value in it. None. All right. Never let the process cause you to fail. That's really, that's really just, that's just not right. Either change it or live with it. But don't, like, don't fail. So what happens if you're, uh, you have to then ask the question after you've tried all these things, right? Every single one of you. Can a Cologne collaborator ever collaborate? Or, oh, we gotta work around them. Unfortunately, some of them, it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna be able to get to them. It's unfortunate, but you're gonna have to learn to live with them. So the first thing you have to do is reflect, not react. 
always when I'm sitting in an office and the non-collaborator is ranting and raving about something and I go, and I can feel my blood rising, and I want to get in an argument, I just kind of sit there for a while. I say, nah, nah, nah. And I leave, and I go home, and I calmly sit down quietly and think about it, and get all of that stuff outside. It's a little interesting phenomenon. I try and think, I have this barrier around me. Nothing can get in. What do I need to learn from this? I go there. But I don't let them get to me. I always say this, so I'll get back to you on that. This is my favorite slogan. <laughs> That means I don't want to talk to you. I mean, I'll get back to you on it. I will get back to you on it if I feel like it's of any value, but at least this gets me out of the room. And this is the other big one that I've had to learn, and I'm still not really good at it all the time. Don't take it personally. Some of these non-collaborators really, I, you know, I think as a consultant I would like to avoid some of these people. But somehow I keep running across them. Every once in a while I hit one of them and I go, these guys are really idiots. <laughs> this is like so damaging. And how can they keep this person in the organization? And, you know, and they go, they pound the living. So I had one and I said to them, executive, I didn't know I was an executive, I would have said it to him anyway. Shows up in the bar after the first day of training. And I said, are you in the class? He said, yeah. I said, you didn't come today. He said, no, I was traveling. I said, you were? I said, it's a two-day class. He said, yeah. I said, you were traveling? Why? He said, oh, I wanted to be with my family over the weekend. I thought, I traveled on Sunday. What was this about? So I said, really? He said, yeah. And then when I got here, I went to the gym. Oh. Ooh, boy. Needless to say, after a whole day of teaching people, I was a little not on my best. So I gave him a little heart. You know, instead of coming to me directly, he walked around the whole building to everybody for the whole week and talked to him about maybe we don't need Pollyanna in our company. Finally, I got drifted and sat down and apologized. I said, I had a bad day. I had a really bad day. I'm sorry, you just caught me off. It doesn't happen very often, ask people. He refused to ask anybody. He was a guy who floated around the company, then had taken leave for three, six months to be with his family, which I think is fine, came back and was roaming around the country trying to find his own job, being paid enormous amounts of money while he tried to find a niche that no one ever wanted him around. So here he is going on and on about this, ooh, maybe we should not do this, but what really made me mad was, yeah, I made a mistake, I don't mind admitting that. But what made me mad was he didn't allow me to apologize and, him, and for him to accept it. He continued forward saying, you know, wasn't a good thing. Fortunately for me, which I have to say, I, I took it personally. I was a little hurt. I cried all the way home on the airplane. I, no, I didn't say that. No. <laughs> I wasn't very happy, to say the least. It was very painful for me that he wouldn't forgive me and wouldn't allow me to make a mistake. I said, what kind of person does this? Two days later, he was demoted. I went, okay. <laughs> I said, that's karma. That's pretty fast. I said, okay, I guess I gotta get over my taking it personally. So I don't, you know, it doesn't always work out that way, but you have to be careful. And if you really can't keep your mouth closed, leave the room. I'm not joking. Just say, I think I gotta go get my emails. They're bothering me. <laughs> Whatever it is. If all else fails, you might have to remove or isolate your non-collaborator. This is sidelining him, putting him on an island. You know, everybody's ever done this once in a while. I gave this talk to, uh, I mean, I gave a talk about collaborative leadership to uh, 32 executives on an offsite in their, in their uh, billion dollar company. And I said this, put them on an island. And this one person said, we do that. <laughs> you could admit it at that level, you do this. Okay, I guess it's pretty common knowledge. 
You have to isolate them, sideline them, and give them something else to do. Have them go off by themselves, do something that's not um, critical, on the critical path. Whatever you do, protect the team. Isn't that a great picture? I know, it's one of my favorites. And then maybe, I hate to admit this, that it's time for you to move on and find another job, either in the company or in, in another one. So remember your non-collaborator we talked about before? What are your next steps going to be? Anybody got anything that they learned here from this one today? How am I time? Oh, I'm pretty good. Right on time. One hour, exactly. Anyone? Any of these steps found useful? This is the part where you're supposed to respond. Um, yeah? A few times you mentioned um, getting these three people in a room. What if you have a non-collaborator remote? Can you try to get on an airplane? No, get them all three of them. Three of them on the phone. Three of them on Skype. Skype lets you have groups now. So does Google Hangout. That's even better when you can see them. A lot better. No, whatever. I don't. I don't have to be in the room. Then, in a virtual world, now they just have to be on the phone call. Yeah. What about um, yeah? People that are sociopathic is one thing, but then there's the clueless non-collaborator. The clueless non-collaborator that they don't know what they're not doing. Yeah, they don't know their effect. So I, I, will, I'm being generous. <laughs> Are these people that don't make an impact or people that make a negative impact? Uh, I'd say it's negative. Yeah. yeah. The negative impact and they don't have any idea they're doing it. I know. I just sat, I just sit there and watch this go on. They like live in their own little world somewhere. Yeah. In those cases, uh, you either give them a project that's just theirs and they don't work with anybody else. <laughs> or send them to a remote location and work by themselves. That's what I've seen happen in organizations. Once you put them by themselves, they usually feed on other people. So if they're by themselves, they won't stay there very long. Right, they'll find someone else to dysfunction with. Yeah, they'll go to another company. That's all you can hope for. Yeah, back there. At what point do you just fire these Oh, well, that's a good point. Let me tell you this. Oh, okay. Here's a good thing. I didn't put this reference here. There's this really great book called The No Asshole Rule by Robert Sutton out of Stanford. This is a very powerful book. It's difficult. It's depressing to read. But I read it in two days. You know, you can't put the thing down. He has a chart in there. Remember when I talked about speaking the language of the managers? He has a chart in there where you can actually figure out the amount of money these people are costing the company. Wow. <laughs> so they had this one company, he uses one example. This one company where they had their number one sales guy who was a real asshole. And so they did the chart, the money. They found out that he cost the company. $168,000 a year. It was easy for the management to say, see ya. The other thing that Sutton talks a lot about in his book is asshole spread. If you leave one in the company, you're going to get more of them. <laughs> you have to be careful that you don't take care of them. Now, when do you fire them? In my opinion, I do a thing that I call the vacation test because I am definitely focused on my team's success and I need to find out if my team needs this person or not before I deal with them. <coughs> so I give them the vacation test. I ask them to do a project where no one else is involved, they can't get to the team. I ask them maybe to take a vacation or I send them to a conference like this. <laughs> I want to see if the team can live without them. <laughs> so, if my team works just fine without this person, 
next bus stop is theirs, they're gone. The one thing I have to admit I love about being an executive when I was an executive is I could go down to HR and have somebody fired in five minutes. It was the real joy of my existence. <laughs> now, when you have that much power, you don't use it very often, but we did once. Uh, the other thing is, if your team needs them, you have two choices. You either put them on an island, and then you tell the team whatever you want from them, put it in a bottle, put it in a boat, send it out there, have them do their work, put it back in the, back in the boat, and send it back to you. They're totally isolated. As soon as the team doesn't need them anymore, next bus stop is theirs. History. Then, if they can't do that, they have to integrate with them. I sit down with the team and I said, what kind of rules of engagement do you want to set up to working with this person until you're done with them? And then let them come up with them. Make sense? Question over here? Yeah. Um, uh, in my mind, collaborators and non-collaborators are more of a spectrum than a either or. Yep. Oh, okay. So he wants to know that collaboration and non-collaborators is not an either or, it's a spectrum, right? So the interesting part is if you, you have to do an exercise with yourself that say, where am I on the spectrum and where's my non-collaborator? Most people sit there and go, really? I'm not as a collaborator as I thought I was. It's an eye-opener. There are two other pieces to this. One is trust. Where are they on the trust spectrum? And you. And the other one is integrity. So you have to deal with all three of those and find out where they are. It, it is not clear, but if you can't get them to work with you to get done what needs to get done, it, it doesn't matter where they are on the spectrum. They're still in there somewhere. They're less than cooperative. So you can work on it. Very interesting process. Yeah, right there. So I agree with many things that you share here, but it's something that uh, is a little bit difficult for me to understand. I just, it, sometimes we are not considering this person uh, some someone who we want to work with, right? It's evil. It's not collaborator. It's evil, right? It's a bad person. We don't like them. So how can you build this trust with a person that you start with not liking, right? <laughs> so uh, you have to develop empathy to work with people, right? And feel comfortable with that people to build the trust that you mentioned before. So how can you build that? They starting with that basis and then using a third person, using all those tips, all that strategy, starting with the basic, with the fundamentals or about, I don't like this person. It's a non collaborator Usually, I don't like them for any other reasons than non collaboration So, starting from that, I don't want to talk. Don't do to anything. Them. Don't, yeah, don't do anything. The don't idea here is, if I have to, if I have to work with them, I don't like them much personally. I've learned over the years to try and figure it out. Trust them. I don't know about trust, but I will talk to them about trying to work with them if I need what they have, or I find that they're useful to the project, I'll figure out a way. I'm all about success for my teams. I am totally success driven. I am rapid, rampant about it. I want my teams to succeed, and I'm a total enabler, whatever they want, including giving them air cover and spending every Sunday afternoon talking to the boss so they'll leave my team alone. I don't care. There are some people that personality conflicts happen and it's very difficult. You know, if you can't figure out a way to work with them, then you can't work with them, period. You're done. It's one of those you gotta get rid of them or put them on another team. It just happens. There are a lot of personality conflicts in the business. It's very interesting to me. But why about developing these empathy? Yeah, empathy. You want to? Yeah, I usually have a lot of empathy, but I have a hard time for those people that are self-centered and passive-aggressive. 
I'm sorry, I can't be I can't be empathetic with those people. No matter how I run a drill in my head, I cannot ever see I do not ever see them doing something positive for the success of the team. Now, if any of you have such a story, write it to me in my email. I'll publish them and not give you any credit. <laughs> but I do not, I do, I've never seen it. All I do when I see them is think, they are such a waste and drain on the company and the energy of the company and the resources of the company. And usually when we put ads in place, these people pop up like crazy and you see them. And all of a sudden, the leaders see them and they go, oh, we gotta do something get out your no asshole rule book and start doing the calculations. <laughs> and sure enough, you'll come up with it. It's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, I don't understand why we keep these people in the company so long. I once asked somebody, a vice president of a bank, how long does it take you to get rid of somebody? He said, 18 months. He said, you're joking. I said, those poor team members, I have to work with them. That's outrageous. What a waste. I'd hate that. That's painful. I don't want that. No, we gotta move faster. Because the whole organ and every everything's moving faster. Can't waste your leadership on trying to fix somebody who can't be fixed. <coughs> Change the process. Other questions? Yeah, right there. How can I be sure that I'm not the one being a non-collaborator? <laughs> <laughs> How can I be sure I'm not the I'm the one I'm not the one who's being what? The non oh, the non-collaborator? You can't be. You're never sure, but you have to trust yourself, I guess. You have to think: Am I giving him? You know, it's it's a little empathy, but am I giving him the benefit? Am I helping here, or am I getting in the way? If you go back and look at all these tools, right? This is, this whole stuff is in the, uh, and more details are in the book, The Agile Culture, Leading Through Trust and Ownership, that we just published in March. If you go through those and you say, that applies to me. Oh, really? That applies to me? Oh, I've done that before. Then maybe it's self-learning. <laughs> Good idea. You learn how to manage yourself. Novel concept. You could be better at it. Most everybody who takes my uh, collaborative leadership, the collaborating with non collaborators, say at some point, oh yeah, I'm not always a collaborator, am I? <laughs> I remember one class I taught at IBM. And I come in and I said, yeah, okay, everybody pick your non collaborator. And I made them call them out, not name, but. Then this one guy says, I don't have anybody. I, there aren't any non collaborators. <laughs> said, I don't have anybody. I said, really? I said, okay. So we get through the whole class. And then he's sitting there very quiet at the end. And he said, I guess what you're telling me is there's some people in my organization i got to get rid of. I said, uh, yeah, bingo. Took him the whole day to figure it out. Oh, I don't have any non-collaborators. And then he realized he did. So yeah, everybody at some point when they start thinking about it say, oh, so I've had my moments. I've had my moments. Still do. But I try my best. Questions? Any other questions? Okay, I have to say that first uh, Oriana's presentation of this conference was very successful. If you know about success, then you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.